Hi, Scope readers. Mackenzie Caro here. I'm a writer here at Scope, and today I'm going to read you my article, Sneaker Nation, How a Humble Athletic Shoe Became an American Icon, by Mackenzie Caro. It was April 1985, and everyone was talking about Michael Jordan. The six foot six basketball player from North Carolina was nearing the end of his first season in the NBA, and he was already a star. He was strong yet nimble, fast yet graceful, fiercely competitive yet cool under pressure. His brilliant moves on the court were quickly becoming legendary. But that April, it wasn't just Jordan's extraordinary athletic skill that everyone was buzzing about. There was something else of his that no one could stop talking about. His sneakers. A global obsession. Jordan's sneakers were called Air Jordans. Nike had designed the shoes for Jordan after he agreed to endorse a new line of basketball sneakers for the brand. The first Air Jordans were red and black, far flashier than what NBA players wore at the time. To keep a uniform look on the court, league rules at the time required that shoes be at least 51% white. After the NBA pointed this out, Nike designed a version with a little more white for Jordan to wear in games. When Air Jordans went on sale in April 1985, they flew off shelves. In just one year, Nike had made $126 million on Air Jordans alone. No other sneaker in history had been as lucrative. The wildly successful launch of Air Jordans marked a turning point in our relationship with sneakers. What was once simply a comfortable, practical shoe had become a global obsession. From luxury to necessity. Today, sneakers are a $58 billion industry. There are hundreds of styles, colors, and brands to suit our every outfit and mood. For most of us, sneakers are an essential and beloved part of not just our wardrobes, but our lives. There are hundreds of styles, colors, and brands to suit our every outfit and mood. For most of us, sneakers are an essential and beloved part of not just our wardrobes, but our lives. It hasn't always been this way, though. In the mid-1800s, when the first sneakers were created, they were considered luxury items. The canvas, rubber-soled shoes were expensive and meant for playing croquet and tennis. Only the very wealthy had time for such recreational activities. As the turn of the century approached, this began to change. Many employers were cutting back on working hours, leaving Americans with more free time. Meanwhile, new public parks, gyms, and tennis and basketball courts were springing up across the country. This meant that more Americans could play sports and exercise during their time off. It also meant that more Americans needed sneakers. Fortunately, improvements in manufacturing were making sneakers less expensive. By the 1920s, most people could afford a pair. Still, it would be decades before the sneaker transformed into the coveted fashion item that it is today. A winning combination. The sneaker industry as we know it today began to take shape in the 1970s. That's when companies started pumping out a variety of styles and colors to appeal to a wider range of needs and personalities. Now you could get Nikes in electric blue, Pumas in striking yellow, or Adidas with candy apple red stripes. Advertising was changing too. Companies began zeroing in on the most talented athletes and enlisting them to market new designs. In 1973, Puma released a signature shoe, the Puma Clyde, for basketball star Walt Clyde Frazier. Not only was Frazier a superstar player from the New York Knicks, but he was also consistently found on best-dressed lists. Puma's collaboration with Frazier linked the worlds of fashion and professional basketball to create a top-selling product. But the sneaker industry didn't hit its stride until the Air Jordan. Sneakers like the Puma Clyde were popular among diehard fans of basketball and fashion, 
particularly in urban areas like New York City. But Air Jordans were popular among everyone, everywhere. After all, Michael Jordan was one of the greatest athletes in the world. Everyone knew his name. High-profile athletes are only part of the sneaker story, though. Elizabeth Semelhack from the Beta Shoe Museum in Toronto, Canada, says music played a big role, too. For example, in 1986, the hip-hop group Run DMC, known for sporting Adidas superstars, released a song titled My Adidas. Adidas sales spiked, and the group signed a $1 million endorsement deal. It was these kinds of collaborations with athletes and artists, explains Semelhack, that created the cultural obsession with sneakers that continues to this day. What you end up with is this incredible mixture of basketball, hip-hop and rap, dance, and fashion, says Semelhack. And that sets the groundwork for what continues to be some of the magic of sneakers today. Like Precious Gems By the end of the 1980s, sneaker sales had reached $12 billion, having nearly doubled since the start of the decade. By the 1990s, sneakerheads were collecting sneakers like precious gems. Sneaker releases had become highly anticipated events, with hordes of customers camping out hours before stores opened. Kids began saving up for months to buy the latest designs. Since then, our obsession has only grown. And with brands dreaming up new styles and collaborations all the time, that obsession will likely continue. Meanwhile, Air Jordans remain one of the most popular sneakers of all time. In fact, this past August, Nike revived the original Air Jordan design and released it in new colors. The shoes were, of course, a wild success.